Hi everyone, so we're going to continue now to talk about MO theory and specifically how the uh, energy of these molecular orbitals are then related to the electron configuration of the molecules, okay? So if you remember from the previous video, we were discussing how to form these molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals and our example was using H2 which contains two atoms of hydrogen and each hydrogen has a 1s atomic orbital and when you do a linear combination of the two 1s atomic orbitals it's the same like adding the two waves that represent the 1s wave function and when you add waves you can do that through constructive interference or you can do it through destructive interference and it turns out that when you do it through constructive interference then you get this particular molecular orbital called the sigma 1s. So it's a type of molecular orbital called the bonding molecular orbital. And then when you add the 2 1s atomic orbital through destructive interference, then you get this other type of molecular orbital called the antibonding MO. Okay? So that's where we left off, and we discussed a little bit about the energies of this two. And what I said there was that the energy of the bonding MO is going to be lower uh, the sigma 1s is going to be lower than the antibonding, which is called the sigma 1s star. And the reason is because in the sigma 1s, you have electron density located in between the two nuclei, which is great in maximizing electrostatic interactions between the positively charged nuclei and the negatively charged electron. Whereas in the sigma 1s star, electron density distribution, you see that most of the electron density is distributed on the side, but in the middle, there's a node, which means that there's no electron density in between the two nuclei. So in other words, the distribution of electron density is more stabilizing for the bonding MO, so as a result, the bonding MO is lower in energy, and that's why we draw them this way in an energy diagram, the bonding MO being a lower one and the antibonding MO being the higher one. Okay, so you'll see this a lot of times, this drawing will be shown the following way. So you're going to have your sigma 1s and sigma 1s star molecular orbital. Remember that these molecular orbitals are formed by the atomic orbital. So, so you'll see symbols that are drawn this way. Okay, and what that really means is that it connects the molecular orbital to the atomic orbital. In other words, the sigma 1s and the sigma when a star are being formed as a result of adding or linear combination of the wave functions that correspond to the two 1s orbitals. So you see diagrams of uh, atomic orbitals forming the molecular orbitals as shown in this particular picture right here. Okay? The reason, one of the reasons why the sigma 1s star is called antibonding is because it's higher in energy in comparison to the atomic orbital, okay? So if you imagine this to be your energy diagram, the energy of the atomic orbital is right here, right? So I'm just going to use the symbol AO to represent atomic orbital. Now if you look at the way the orbitals are arranged, the energy of the sigma 1s is actually lower than the energy of the atomic orbital when you do the calculation. So that implies that if your electron is found in the bonding orbital, that's a good thing. That means you've lowered the energy of the system, which means that the processes would tend to go from the atomic form to the molecular form. However, the energy of the antibonding orbital is actually higher than the energy of the atomic orbital. So in other words, if your electron is placed in the antibonding orbital, it's going to be less stable, so then it would prefer to just stay as atoms, as separate atoms. So that's why one molecular orbital is called bonding, because it encourages bonding. If electrons are found here, then bonding is preferred. If electrons are found here, then bonding is not preferred. So once you have your energy diagram and your molecular orbital, you can then start to fill up electrons into them. Okay? How many electrons do you need to put in? The molecular orbitals depend on how many electrons you have in the molecule. So if you think about H2, H2 of course has two electrons total. So then the way you fill up the electron is you do it the same way as you've been doing for the atomic orbitals. You start from the lower energy uh, orbitals first and then you go up and then if you have degenerate orbitals you're going to use Hunt's rule which means that the electron will fill them up one at a time and we're not going to see degenerate orbitals until we get to the second period. And then um, again with Pauli's exclusion principle that means you can only have a maximum of two electrons per orbital. 
Okay. In this case, hydrogen has two electrons. The lower energy orbital is the sigma 1s, so I'm going to put two electrons there, and that's it. That would be the electron configuration for my H2 molecule. You can also write this as sigma 1s2, or sigma 1s squared. Remember, that's the way we do it for the atomic orbital as well. It would usually be just 1s squared, but in this case, it will be sigma 1s, sigma 1s being the molecular orbital. Okay? There's one other property that's very useful to calculate, something we call the Born order. And the Born order is calculated the following way, which is you take the number of electrons you have in the bonding MO, and you subtract from it the number of electrons in the anti-bonding MO, and you divide that by 2, and then you get the value of Born order. Let's go back to the H2 molecule and see how we can calculate this. Okay, so this is our electron configuration. To calculate the Born order, I would say it is the number of electrons in the bonding molecular orbital, which in this case there's two of them, and then the number of electrons in the antibonding is none, is zero, divided by two, so in other words, the bond order here is 1.0, okay? Now, what exactly does the bond order tell us? The bond order is proportional to bond strength. What's that mean? That means that the higher the bond order, the stronger the bond, and remember that bond strength is inversely proportional to bond length, right? The bigger the bond order, the stronger the bond, but also the shorter the bond, okay? That's something to keep in mind. Now, let's do a couple more examples with first period elements, just to kind of get us comfortable with doing these type of molecular orbital drawing, as well as calculating bond order. Before I actually go ahead and do the example, one more thing I want to mention is that the bond order, uh, as I said earlier, is proportional to bond strength. The lowest value of bond order you can get, at least in this class, the type of calculations we're going to make, is zero. So in other words, bond order equal to zero is the lowest value you can get. When the bond order is equal to zero, that means that the number of electrons are the same in bonding and anti-bonding, which means that the energy in this case doesn't really prefer molecule formation, but it's the same whether you have the molecule or the atom. So when the bond order is equal to zero, that means that the molecule doesn't exist. Okay? And as you go to higher and higher value of bond order, then molecules exist, and the bond gets stronger and stronger. So here's an example from your lecture slide on predicting whether a following species can exist based on MO theory. Okay, and then if the species exists, write its electron configuration and draw, draw its MO energy diagram. And basically what you need to do here is kind of start from the end first. Start actually from this part of the question first, draw the MO energy diagram. And then afterwards you go ahead and predict whether a molecule can exist, and then you can then complete it with the electron configuration. So we have four molecules or molecular ions that we need to work with, and we're going to write them on the next page. So the question is on all these four species. Now, the first three species are what we call molecular ions, okay? The reason is because they are uh, molecules, but they also are ionized. Uh, one of the electrons is gone, or you gain one electron, so they're called molecular ions. And then the last species, He2, is just a molecule. The question is, will any of these things exist? Well, in order to know whether they can exist or not, we need to calculate the bond order, because like I said earlier, if the bond order is equal to zero, the molecule doesn't exist. But in order to get the bond order, I have to be able to draw configuration of the molecule itself. Okay, so in other words, first I have to start with this energy diagram. And because both hydrogen and helium are on the first period. The only molecular orbitals that you can form is the sigma 1s and sigma 1s star molecular orbital. Okay, so there's no other molecular orbital you can form. There are others, but these would be the ground state molecular orbitals. Okay, so I'm going to do this for all or four of these species. And then what I'm going to do is then fill them up accordingly. Okay, so how many electrons do I need to put in? Well, that depends on how many electrons I have in my species. Now H2 plus, because it's H2, it has two, but then you have a plus one, so that's minus one. So in other words, you only have one electron here, right? If you calculate valence electron. For H2 minus, it'll be three electrons because you have two from the H2 plus one because of the negative charge. He2 plus, in this case, He, each He is two valence electron. You have four valence electron minus one, so it's also three electrons. And then lastly, He2 is four electrons. Okay, so then how do you put the electrons in? Well, just the way you've been doing for atoms as well. Here you have one electron, so it's going to just go here. Here you have three electrons, so it's going to one, two, 
and Pauli's exclusion principle, maximum of two electrons, so you have to go to the next one. Here are three electrons, so same thing. And then four electrons is one, two, three, and four. Okay. Now the next question is, what is the uh, bond order? Because the bond order will then tell us whether a molecule will exist or not, right? Un unless the bond order is zero, a molecule will exist. So let's calculate the bond order. Bond order in this case is one, remember it's the number of electrons in the bonding uh, orbital, minus zero divided by two, so in other words, here is half. So if it's half, molecule will exist, okay? And then you go to the next one, bond order here is two in the bonding, minus one in the antibonding, divided by two, so you get a half as well. So also this one exists. If you do it for the HE2+, plus, you get the same value, which is 2 minus 1 over 2, so it's also a half. And lastly, if you do it for HE2, you get uh, 2 minus 2 over 2, which is 0. So this one will not exist, okay? It, it's predicted by molecular orbital not to exist, and the other three will exist, okay? Now, the only, of course, the confirmation of this would be in experiment, and it turns out that all these three ions, even though they look kind of funny, have been shown to exist in experiment, okay? Whereas this species have not been shown to exist in experiment. So that's really kind of the confirmation of the correctness of the molecular orbital model in, in predicting uh, properties of molecule. One more concept I want to talk about is this concept of magnetism, okay? And there's basically two type of magnetic property we can think of. Something is paramagnetic, okay, whether a molecule or an atom, if it has at least one unpaired electron. Whereas compounds or atoms are called diamagnetic if all their electrons are paired. So in this case, if you look carefully in the previous question, you notice that molecular ion 1, 2, and 3, H2+, plus, H2-, minus, and He2+, plus, they're all paramagnetic, right, because they have at least one unpaired electron. And then this one, if it existed, the He2 would have been diamagnetic.